Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praises be to Allah alone. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves us say, none can show Him guidance. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah alone and I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his final messenger. Today's episode, my dear viewers, is the 18th in the series, in the new series of uh, the prophetic etiquette and morals by Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. May Allah have mercy on him and may Allah be pleased with him. And it's still in the chapter of the virtues of maintaining ties of kinship and upholding the ties of kinship, etc. And we'll begin with hadith number 51. This hadith is actually uh, an author from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhumah. So let's learn what Abdullah ibn Abbas May Allah be pleased with him and his father. Said in this regard, pertaining to the ayah of Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17, ayah number 26. An Abdullah ibn Abbas in Qal, وَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَى حَقَّهُ وَالْمِسْكِينَ وَبْنَ السَّبِيلِ قَالْ بَدَأَ فَأَمَرَهُ بأوجب الحقوق ودله على أفضل الأعمال إذا كان عنده شيء فقال وآت ذا القربى حقه والمسكين وابن السبيل وعلمه إذا لم يكن عنده شيء كيف يقول فقال وإما تعرضن عنهم ابتغاء رحمة من ربك ترجوها فقل لهم فقل لهم قولا ميسورا عدة حسنة كأنه قد كان ولعله أن يكون إن شاء الله ولا تجعل يدك مغلولة إلى عنقك أي لا تعطي شيئا ولا تبسطها كل البسط تعطي ما عندك أي كله فتقعد ملوما يلومك من يأتيك بعد ولا يجد عندك شيئا محسورا قال قد حسرك من قد أعطيته uh, This is a very fascinating explanation of ترجمان القرآن The greatest مفسر of the Quran of the companions Abdullah ibn Abbas May Allah be pleased with him Concerning uh, number 26 of Surah Al-Isra um, let me let, let me read uh, the hadith. Even though I really really prefer to take you out of the context of the hadith for a minute and recite these verses and give you their meaning. So if you can display them on the screen, so that when we explain according to Abdullah ibn Abbas, we comprehend his message and what he meant. So from Ayah number 26, beginning from Ayah number 26 of Surah Al-Isra, Allah the Almighty says, 
وآت ذا القربى حقه والمسكين وابن السبيل ولا تبذر تبذيرا and that means and give the relatives his right or their rights and also the poor and the traveler and do not spend wastefully إن المبذرين كانوا إخوان الشياطين وكان الشيطان لربه كفورا. That is آية number twenty seven. Indeed, المبذرين those who spend wastefully are the brothers of devils, similar to شياطين. And Satan has been to his Lord ungrateful. وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِرَبِّهِ كَفُورًا Then in the following ayah, number 28 of the same chapter, Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17, he says, وَإِمَّا تُعْرِضَنَّ عَنْهُمُ بِتِغَاءَ رَحْمَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكَ تَرْجُوهَا فَقُلْ لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَيْسُورًا And if you have to turn away from the needy, awaiting mercy from your Lord and you don't have the means now so you're waiting for Allah to provide for you so you can give them what you, what you expect then tell them speak to them as gentle words like you know inshallah in the future hopefully when Allah provides for me I will give you guys وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبَسُطَهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا And don't you make your hand as chain to your neck. This is a metaphor which means don't be stingy. Nor extend it completely. That's another metaphor which means you spend everything all at once. Then you'll end up being blamed by whom by those who will come in the future asking for help but you don't have any and insolvent and you will feel bad because you've given everything you have for one person or two persons and then the rest you cannot afford to give them these ayat of surat al-isra beginning from 26 to 28 29 Guide us as how to deal with the relatives, with the miskin, the needy, and the, the wayfarers. And how much you give, and if you don't have the means, what to tell them, to assure them with gentle words. Inshallah, when Allah provides for me, I'll be more than happy to give you. And Allah guided us to keep balance. Not to be tight and stingy, and that's what said, لا تجعل يدك مغلولة إلى عنقك. You know how the Quran blamed the Yahud, Banu Israel, for saying awful words about Allah. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَةً غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُوْعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوا طَتَانِ يُنْفِقُوا كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ So the Jews said Allah's hand is chained to his neck, which means he is kind of Yani, may Allah forgive me, may Allah forgive us all. I'm quoting what Allah said about them, saying about him that he's tight, cheap, doesn't spin. May Allah forgive us. Narrating the word of disbelief, which others say, as long as you don't believe it, it is not a disbelief. So the Almighty Allah responded to them by saying بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ Rather indeed his hands are stretched out with spending يُنْفِقُ كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ He spends as much as he wants, he's the most generous. So Allah says, you, a believer, لَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ I said this is a metaphor. Don't be like a person whose hands chained to his neck. In what sense? He cannot reach out to his pocket and take to give in charity because his hands are already maghlulatun, chained to his neck. Nor should you just be wasteful and spend everything all at once. Then you will regret because you have nothing anymore. Rather keep balance. And you give this a little bit and this a little bit and so on. Got it? This is the general meaning of the ayat which Abdullah ibn Abbas 
whom the Prophet ﷺ prayed for him and said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen Allahumma alimhu ta'weel. Oh Allah, make him comprehend the religion. Oh Allah, teach him how to interpret and give tafsir of the Quran. And that's why the Ummah recognizes Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, as Tarjuman al Quran, the greatest mufassir of the Quran. So this Athar tells us what Abdullah ibn Abbas understood with regards to these verses. So when he read in Anna number 26, وَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَ حَقَّهُ Now I'm going to take you back to hadith number 51 from the beginning. Quote it as is and then have a little commentary on it. Even though it would be very obvious uh, to understand what Abdullah ibn Abbas said. So he said about the verse, uh, give your relatives their due and the miskeen, the extremely poor, and Ibn al-Sabil. By the way, Ibn al-Sabil doesn't literally mean traveler or travelers. Rather, it means wayfarers, which means a traveler who doesn't have any means, ran out of fund, ran out of provision, so he's in need. Otherwise, there are people who travel first class, and they stay in the golden lounge, platinum lounge, and they have the best accommodation. Those guys are not in need for help. So Ibn Sabil is a traveler who doesn't have the means. He's eligible for zakah, not only for voluntary charity. This is Anna number 26. So he said, look, look what Allah said. He began by commanding us to give to the most pressing of the obligatory dues. And he directs us to the best action if we have any surplus or money to give. To begin with whom? وَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَى Give the relative, your family members, siblings, nephews and nieces, cousins, uncles, far cousins, the closer is the better. It is not something recommended, nor does it make sense to look for people out of town or out of the family and give while you already have. Your family members are desperately in need. So the Almighty has guided us to begin with whom? The Qurba, the relatives. And then those who are not related to you, but they are miskeen. Many of the Mufassirin say al miskeen is in a poorer condition than the poor. And by the way, miskin could be perceived as an ambiguous word, which means also they're poor, but they are not desperately poor. But anyway, they are eligible in either opinion. So give the poor and the wayfarers who are traveling and they ran out of fund. They don't have any means, nothing to continue their journey or to return home. So they are eligible also for your financial help. Alhamdulillah. What is the order? The Al-Qurba relatives. Al-Miskeen, the poor. Ibn al-Sabil, the wayfarer. Got it? Okay. So Abdullah ibn Abbas understood it as this order is not done haphazardly. This is a divine guidance as whom to begin with. And first thing should come first. I should take care of the relatives. Masha'Allah, you're blessed. You have a nice house. You have multiple cars. You drive my back. You have maids and servants. And you have cousins. Somebody who's in the ICU. And they're stuck because they cannot afford to pay. How much you pay your zakah? Approximately 400,000 every year. This guy's in the hospital and he's your cousin. Oh, I didn't know that I can give zakah to my cousin or to my brother. Now I'm telling you. Allah said, وَآتِذَا الْقُرْبَ Begin with the relatives. And the Prophet ﷺ assured you, when you give the relatives, you receive double reward. The reward for giving any charity, whether the alms, the obligatory zakah, or the voluntary charity, in addition to the reward for upholding the ties of kinship. Great. Obviously, Al-Masakin and Ibn Sabil are also uh, listed in the eight categories of those who are eligible for zakah, uh, number 60, chapter number 
9 سورة التوبة إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين والعاملين عليها والمؤلفة قلوبهم to the end of the eye continue what Abdullah ibn Abbas said وعلمه أن الله Almighty teaches us what we can say if we don't have money to give so he said but if you don't and if you do turn away from them because you don't have the means waiting for mercy from your Lord you're expecting some fund to come or some financial uh, aid to come then tell them speak to them with words that bring them ease hmm? a good word and maghfira khairun min sadaqatin yatba'uha adha better than giving in a charity and hurting the feeling of the recipient this is what Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah here in uh, number 28 so you don't have a new cousin or a miskin or your maid or your neighbor or somebody who is desperately in need said sir uh, my son is getting married and we're broke and we need you know somebody to help us a little bit so you can say well I'm not your daddy, I'm not your sugar daddy, oh, go work, earn on your own, Habibi, you don't have the means, say, قَوْلًا مَيْسُورًا In Surah Al-Baqarah, قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Give them words that bring ease to them, assure them, subhanAllah, if I have any means, I will be more than happy to help you, maybe later, inshallah, pray for me, may Allah provide for me a new words of assurance, kind words, deal with them gently, this is even better than actually giving them and hurting their feeling. Look, I'm giving you now, but I don't want to see you, your face anymore. You know, I'm, I shouldn't expect you to come back in a year and say my other daughter is getting married. You know what? You better say sorry and, <laughs> and not give at all. Allahu Akbar. Then things are as they are. But they might change if Allah wills. This is what you tell them. Don't keep your hands at another command from the Almighty Allah. Don't keep your hand chained to your neck. I guess now you know what it means. Don't be cheap. Don't be a miser. Nor give everything all at once, but do not extend it either to its full extent. Don't be wasteful and give everything you have all at once so that you sit there blamed. Blamed by whom? Blame by those who will come later and, and ask you for help and you say, Wallahi, I give everything I have. So they say, and they blame you for doing so. They see you're wealthy, but you don't have uh, fi- cash. You don't have anything to give. So those who come later will blame you because you gave those who came earlier everything. Keep balance. Keep balance. And then he said, the person to whom you have given everything has made you mahsura, regretted. And in this statute, you regret later on, I feel bad that I've given so and so the entire amount. I could have divided it between people and so on. These are divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as how you should dispense your money among the needy ones, whether relatives, poor, destitute, or wayfarers. And that brings to our attention a question. You know, yesterday as I finished the program, I received some phone calls about the distribution of zakat. So somebody said, uh, well, I already paid the due zakat of one of my shops. He has several shops. So this is one branch. I paid uh, his due, its due zakat, and it was in Ramadan. Now I calculated the zakat of the shop and I'm planning to pay it. Uh, it was due in the beginning of May, but I'm planning to postpone it so I can pay it during the days of Dhul Hijjah or Eid Al Adha in order to get a greater reward. People who have money and they have zakatable money, they should not behave on their own and dispense their wealth or their zakat without consulting the people of knowledge. Why, if your business grows bigger, mashallah, and you prosper, you gotta have a consultant, a lawyer, 
and uh, uh, an accountant, somebody who will deal with the taxes, don't mess with the taxes. You know, you'll finish, you'll disappear, you'll go behind bars. You make no mistakes when you deal with Uncle Sam and with the taxes. What about zakah? You assume on your own. And for years, you're neglectful of the payment of your zakah. Or you pay it in different forms or shapes or different times, which is not valid because you think this is the right thing. Years and years, 20 years, you've been doing the same. Not once, not once, you thought about let me hire or pay a sheikh or a scholar to teach me what am I supposed to do with my zakah. So I asked the brother, when did you actually stop possessing the nisab? Because when you say, I have several shops, so I decided to pay this shop zakah in Ramadan and this shop zakah <laughs> on the hijjah It doesn't go this way. It goes as follows. The day you started possessing certain amount of money, and this amount was equivalent to 85 gram of gold, whether it is $6,000, $6,500, $5,000, depending on today's value of the gold. 85 gram of 24K. 85 gram of 25K. So if it is worth Six thousand dollars, assuming today, Masha Allah, I become rich, and this money is surplus. Either I'm going to invest it, or I'm going to save it, or keep it beneath my pillow, or give it to somebody as a loan. This is your money. When did you start possessing this amount? What is today? Oh, today I believe it's like the fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth of Dhul Qadah. In your notes. In your calendar, say, please, next year, 15th of Dhul-Qi'dah, I need to check on my positions. Next year, mashallah, a month before Hajj, 15th of Dhul-Qi'dah, the $6,000, which was the Nisab back then, had become 18. Then 18 times 2.5%. What is the percentage? Oh, this is how much zakah is due. You need to pay them right now. But I'm traveling and I will be back in a couple of days. No problem. I was planning to distribute the money among some poor cousins. So I'm going to visit them in a few days. No problem. No, but I think it will be best if I can delay it to pay during the first 10 days of the Hijjah. This is none of your business. Because what determines the due date of the payment of zakah? Not you. It is the day you started possessing the nisab, which should be marked down in your calendar, and every year you work accordingly. So, mashallah, your business expanded. One shop, two franchise, you have a thousand now. All the 1,000, 15, Dhul Qiyadah, I need to check on all my positions, investment, saving, loans, and start calculating before that. So, 15, Dhul Qiyadah, boom, I start distributing the zakah. Why? Because this is the hawl. When do I consider a different hawl, different date for my, the payment of my zakah? When I have some money that was earned, not because of me. Not because of an investment of money which I already possess. My father passed away. I inherited a couple million. And my zakah is due next week. Wait a minute. Don't add the inheritance to the nisab which you're supposed to pay zakah on it. Why? Because he was earned independently. He didn't do anything to earn it. You just happened to inherit it. So if your zakah due date is on the 15th of Dhul Qadah and you have earned the inheritance on the 30th of Ramadan, the first of Shawwal, so now we have two different dates. Because this money was earned independently, not because of your investment, not because of you. So now, 15th of Dhul Qadah of every year, I look into my positions, investment and saving, and pay the Jews account on that. 
First of Shawwal, when I inherited from my father, whatever amount, it was two million. I paid the zakah on it. Then the two million was invested. Whatever comes as a profit as a result of that is also included in the payment of zakah. A third trick. Can I, can I combine the two dates so that I only have one fixed date every year? No problem. But it should be the earlier, not the later. Should be the one in Shawwal, not the one in the Qa'dah. You don't delay the zakah payment once it is due. I said it is okay to delay it for a few days because you are in the process of distributing the zakah. Not to keep it with you and say, um, Inshallah, a couple months later during Hajj, I'm going to give your zakah. This is a major sin, haram. Your zakah is you in Rajab. You say, I'm waiting to give it away in Ramadan in order to augment the reward. Haram. That's a major sin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you spend, whether the voluntary charity or the mandatory zakah, and you begin by, Ati dal qurba haqqahu. What does the word haqqahu means? When I look it up in the dictionary, haqq means right, obligation. You're not doing them a favor. You're paying them their due rights. When you give dowry to your wife, you're not doing her a favor. That is her haqq. So when you say, honey, I wish to buy you the world, but I don't have money now. So can I give you now a hundred bucks and the deferred amount, one million dollar? You agree to that? Yes. So this one million dollar has become a loan you owe to your wife. Not only when you die or when you divorce. No, once you have this money, honey, thank you so much. This is your haqq. This is your haqq. وَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَى حَقَّهُ وَالْمِسْكِينَ وَبِنَ السَّبِيلِ Likewise, there is haqq for the miskin. There is haqq for those who are poor and eligible wayfarers. Uh, etc. in your money. The obligation 2.5% Rubu al And if you're generous and you give more وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُهُ Whatever you spend in a charity for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it. And not with the same. Allah is the most generous. That was a very beautiful hadith and uh, Alhamdulillah in this segment we barely covered one hadith. We'll take a short break before we tackle the next chapter, which is Babu Fadl, Salat al Rahim, the virtues and the excellence of upholding the ties of kinship. So we'll be back, inshallah, in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Salaamu Allahi Alaikum Wa Rahmatuhu Wa Barakatuhu And welcome back my dear viewers Second segment in today's program of Guardians of the Pious Our phone numbers will be appearing on the bottom of your screen So if you have any questions dial any of the following numbers Ubaidullah from Pakistan Welcome to Huda TV Salaamu Alaikum Alaikum Salaamu Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu Brother go ahead my question is that is the online trading is halal or haram? Online that is our online trading, trading trading in what? In forex trading that are uh, a stock engine. Okay, so I should be very specific when I say what kind of online trading, currency exchange. If you're exchanging your own money from your account online with a different currency simultaneously at the same time you're purchasing this hoping that the prices will increase this is absolutely permissible what is required in the online trading is what is required in the on-spot trading so is exchanging money exchange permissible permissible different values some currencies one dollar worth 40 of this currency more or less, 
So I'm doing the currency exchange provided yadam bi yad in the same sitting. So you're given this currency and you're taking the other currency at the same time. It doesn't matter what kind of value as long as you both agree to. When does it become forbidden? When I defer the payment of any of the currencies. When I say, just give me now $5,000 and I will pay you later. I will pay you later in, uh, you know, rubies, for instance. This is not permissible. This is riba. Another form of riba. Another form of riba. When you take a loan, okay, from the provider in order to exchange it so that you can make money and then pay. If this loan is interest-based, then online trading is haram as well. Otherwise, if you have a balance and from your own account, you're purchasing any currency, whichever value you agree to you and the seller, you're making a transaction in and out, then this is permissible. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Amina from the KSA, welcome to Huda TV, Amina. Okay, assalamualaikum, doctor. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I actually have two questions uh, pertaining to Hajj. Please go ahead. Okay, the question number one is, um, is there any deadline to perform Tawaf Ifada and Sayy Al Hajj? Because when we follow the package, they will take us uh, to perform Tawaf Ifada and Sayy Al Hajj on 12 Zul Hijjah. But I read somewhere there is no timeline to, uh, there is no deadline to do a question and say there until 13 Zul Hijjah. Uh, is it permissible? Uh, do I need to pay any fidya? That's question number one. Mm -hmm. Question number two, uh, we are planning to do Hajj Kiran. So <clears throat> the Hadi is mandatory and we have to do it through the coupon system using the website adahi.org. And they have informed us that the slaughter will be done up to the Tashrik day. So my question is, on 10th to Hijjah, up, um, after uh, we do the Rami, the snowing, followed by shaving or, or cutting the hair for female, can we remove the ihram or we need to wait for the hadi to be completed, which can be 11, 12 or 13 of Zul Hijjah? Right. Thank you. Questions have, please. Amina, Thank you. I got both of your questions. You can have, hang up and listen to the answers. The first question, Tawaf al-Ifada is one of the main pillars for Hajj. There is Tawaf for Umrah. And now after I return from Arafah, any day on the 10th, 8th day, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, or even to the end of the month of Al-Hijjah. And if a person was not able, it's still required to do Tawaf al-Ifada because you're still in Ihram. It is best to do it as early as possible. When your Hajj organizers say that you schedule according to your Mutawaf to do Hajj, Tawaf al-Ifada on the 12th, this is perfectly fine. And for those who are scheduled to do Tawaf al-Ifada or decided to do Tawaf al-Ifada on the same day of departure, a few hours before departure, Tawaf al-Ifada will be sufficient for both Ifada and farewell tawaf. You do just one tawaf and leave. Because the farewell tawaf is required to be the last thing you do in Mecca. And it happened to be tawaf al ifada. So it is sufficient. I said the earlier is the best. But when we have a couple million people, and then <clears throat> the organizers and the mutawif and the ministry of Hajj have to give and allocate appointments for each group and company. You go now, you go in the morning, you go in the evening, you go before Fajr. So you follow the regulations in order to maintain peace and tranquility in Tawaf. If somebody didn't do Tawaf during 13th, 14th, 15th, no problem. You still owe Tawaf, even if it is to the end of Dhul Hijjah. 
Even if it is beyond that, you are still. When I say you are still in ihram, that would lead us to answering your second question. Those who are doing tamattu or qiran, Allah the Almighty addressed them in Surah Al-Baqarah. He said, فَمَنْ تَمَتَّعَ بِالْعُمْرَةِ إِلَى الْحَجِّ فَمَا اسْتَيْسَرَ مِنَ الْهَدِي If you're doing Umrah and Hajj, any day in Shawwal, in Dhul Qa'da, and in the first eight days of Dhul Hijjah, you've done Umrah before you go to Arafah, and then you're doing Hajj and you want to Arafah, then automatically you're required to give Hajj, even if you didn't intend. Hajj becomes mandatory on each pilgrim who has done Hajj in this year and before that has done Umrah any time beginning from the first day of Shawwal. Now after he threw the stones on the Eid day, which is the 10th day of Dhul Hijjah, Yawm Al-Hajj Al-Akbar, I threw the seven pupils and I went to do Tahallul, shortened or shaved my head. Sister says, can I remove my clothes, the ihram? Of course, because once you cut your hair, now you can change into regular clothes. For men, you can wear stitched clothes, regular kufi and outfit. For women, anyway, your ihram, as far as clothes, is your regular everyday clothes. But now you can use scented soap, shampoo, body wash, perfume. You are not in ihram anymore. Except for the fact that this tahallul is incomplete. It only allows me to remove the ihram outfit, to wash and uh, wear perfume and fragrance for men if you're going out, for women if you're staying in your uh, hotel room. And then in order to have an intimate relationship with your spouse, you must complete your hajj by doing tawaf and sa'i. By doing tawaf and sa'i. So changing into your regular clothes and coming out of the ihram outfit doesn't give you an access to have sexual relations or the foreplay. You have to do tawaf ifada and sa'i. Got it? So the question is, we pay online or we give a rajhi bank or whatever to offer our hajj. So some people ask, how do I know that my hadi has been slaughtered? Do I have to keep in ihram until it is confirmed? Imagine if we're talking about four million heads. Who is going to tell you that your sheep has been sacrificed already? And it is not required to follow it. You entrusted those who are in a charge, you paid for it, you consider it done. So you proceed towards tahallul, cutting or shaving the head changing into your regular clothes. And then when you perform tawaf al-ifada, everything is lawful, including having an intimate relationship with your spouse. But I'm not sure whether they slaughtered my had you or not. You don't have to know whether they have done yours or not, whether they do it today or tomorrow. Bottom line, they make certain that they will do it within the tashriq days. May Allah accept your hajj and umrah. And everyone who's going for Hajj or Umrah, include us in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Umar from Canada, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, brother. How are you? Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. How are you, Umar? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I have one question. Um, so there was a nikah that was performed remotely. The husband and wife uh, have not met and they've not consummated the marriage. Um, the question is, can this nikah be annulled without divorcing or uh, asking for kula? Um, or is it necessary to have either a kula or a divorce? My brother, my brother, wait a minute. Ya Umar, you said the nikah yeah. was concluded online, right? Yeah, online with all the, all the uh, witnesses and uh, okay. uh, the father's permission and everything was done. So uh, the first question, the, the first question should be, is this nikah valid? And you just answer the question. When you said all the requirements were fulfilled, ijab and qabul, yes. both husband and wife know yes. each other, have seen each other, and both agree. The girl's guardian gave yeah, his consent. They, they met remotely. They, they were seen each other remotely, yes. but not uh, physically. Even if they, they haven't seen each other, but they know each other, they met, they, she knows I'm marrying Muhammad Salah. Not anyone else. 
and he knows I'm marrying Layla or Salwa or whoever. We know the document is in front of me. She's 37 years old. I know I'm marrying this girl and she knows that she's marrying this guy and the family uh, is in an agreement and there were witnesses. All of that is virtual. So we have seen the witnesses and they witnessed the proposal and the consent of the guardian. This is as good as physically processing a marriage contract, right? Alhamdulillah, so they're officially married now. They can talk, they can exchange love words, they can even consummate the marriage. Well, for some reason, we didn't travel, we didn't meet, and want to nullify the nikah. Like every valid nikah, there is nullification before consummation versus after consummation. Before consummation and after the aqd, it must be done through talaq, if the husband agrees to divorce. And in this case, there is no iddah. Why? Why not? Because they never touch each other. So once he says you're divorced, she can marry next day if she wants to. Number two, half of the dowry is due for the wife, even though he didn't touch her. Number three, this divorce is irrevocable. He cannot say, no, 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 I changed my mind. I said she can marry next day. There is no idda. Well, they decided the girl's family were not interested. He was trying to obtain a visa. It didn't work out. The immigration refused. So he said, Habibi, qaddar Allahumma shafa'ar. Would you please let go our daughter? Oh, no way. You have to pay me. Uh, Habibi, we cannot do anything about it. Well, I demand one million dollar. This is an evil person. So he resort for khula or for a court to do fasq. Now you know the right order. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Masha from the USA. Welcome to Huda TV, Masha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. What about yourself? Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, as I was listening to your program, you were talking about the delay of zakat and um, uh, some other things. And I was, um, I'm in a dilemma because I have uh, the zakat question that I have is when I acquired, uh, so I have some gold and I don't have any saving account. So I don't have any inheritance. I don't have any property, just gold. And during last year, I have acquired some unexpected medical bills, which I have to pay installments every month. Mm. So some amounts are different. So it's not like one basic amount. So some amounts like $3,000 and another bill is like $1,500. So just a simple calculation. If you can just tell me the steps of how do I mine, um, subtract from my gold and uh, the medical bills and pay my zakat. Mm -hmm. I know I, uh, my zakat, zakat uh, my gold when I got, I acquired so, sister them when Masha, I got married. Sister Masha, yeah. I'd like to help you to make your life easier and to make your uh, question simple to present and to answer. So basically, number one, you're saying that you don't have any money, any savings, you're just your gold, right? Yes. And this gold, uh, are you saving it for the future or sometimes you wear it? Sometimes I wear it and I'm saying to future to pass it down to my kids. It's my duty to tell you that only according to Abu Hanifa, you should pay zakah on that. And according to the rest of the scholars, uh, Malik or Shafi'i or Ahmad, if you wear your gold, it's not zakatable. What do I do? I pay the zakat you on my wife's gold and on my mother's gold with pleasure. And I say, Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us, so I give. So I like to tell you that there is a difference of opinion, okay? But if this gold, you don't wear it, you just save it for the future, guaranteed. All the scholars say you have to pay zakah if it is 85 gram of gold or more, okay? Second question. Now, you chose the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa and you regularly pay zakah on your gold. May Allah bless you, no matter how much is it. You owe money. Medical bills, you pay them on payments. 
as long as the payment is not due at the time or before the payment of zakah, you don't look into the future. Now I have to pay zakah. My zakah is like 70, uh, uh, 75 or uh, 7,500, 7, or $5,000 or whatever. At the time of the payment of zakah, do I have to pay anything now towards the payment of my medical bills? No, it's still next month. I paid already last month. So ignore it and you pay the zakah. And what comes in the future, you pay. And as long as it is before the payment of zakah, it will be deducted. But when there is no due payment right now, you do not deduct it from zakah. I hope you understood me. Did you? Masha? Uh, yes, 80%. 20% confusion is, you said that if the uh, medical payments come before the zakah, but what it becomes every month? What? This is what I said. If it comes every month, I don't care about what comes in the future. Why? Because it is not due right now. What you deduct from the payment of your zakah is what you owe right now, and you have to pay it. So you, you set them aside. But things which you still have to pay over a year or two, you know, you don't deduct them from the zakah. Clear? Okay. Barakallah. Clear. May Allah bless you. And I hope you also, you and all the viewers are clear with regards to the payment of zakah on women's jewelry. Uh, I can tell you all, oh, you must pay zakah on jewelry and that's it because I'm Hanafi and this is my madhab. But it is my duty to share with you that if you choose to follow the opinion of the other scholars, the opinion of the vast majority, they have also the reasons which we have discussed before. I like also to remind my dear viewers, there, there is a program that I filmed years ago, which is called Fiqh of Zakah. And um, it was hosted by Jamir Rashid. And I think Allah knows best. And I think this program is very useful for any person who has to pay Zakah. Review it, view it, and take notes. And if you have any question, come back to me, inshallah, during any of our live programs. We run out of time. I do apologize for all the viewers and all the callers who wanted to call in today, but we ran out of time. This is life. Subhanakallah, hamdik, nashadu an la ilaha al-an, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulaik, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa tasliman kathira, wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One and only glory to him He born in humans to be the best And give his best to religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price <laughs>